68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Com Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of cert. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or an other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. I think I saw that we had quorum um, before we started, but I will take a roll call here. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Here. Ms. Davis. Here yet. Mr. Goddard. Here yet. Dr. Hildreth. Present. Present. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Mr. Holloway. Here. Mr. Hughes. Uh, I'm present. Dr. Lewis. Ms. Ross. Present. Mr. Sweeney. Present. And Mr. Witzel. So we have, we have quorum. Um, I'll move on to Mr. Pinkley for the electronic meeting statement. Thank you, Chair Martinez. Um, I'll keep it brief. Uh, under Governor Lee's current Executive Order 71, which is an extension of previous executive orders, uh, we need a motion, a second, and an affirmative vote to hold our, our meeting today. Essentially, we need to state that we are conducting essential business and we are doing so electronically to protect the safety and welfare of Tennesseans. This is Matt Sweeney. I'll move the motion. Hildreth seconds. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney and Dr. Hildreth. Any folks discussion? If there is none, uh, I'll take a roll call here. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Aye. Ms. Davis. Mr. Goddard. Aye. Dr. Hildreth. Aye. Mr. Holloway. Aye. Mr. Hughes. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Ms. Ross. Aye. Mr. Sweeney. Aye. And Mr. Witzel. All right, and I vote aye as well. Um, I think we have approval of the minutes next. Anyone had any changes? If not, if anyone wants to move to uh, approve the minutes. This is Matt Sweeney. I'm second. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Um, any focus discussion? There is not. I'll do a roll call vote again. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Aye. Ms. Davis. Not here yet. Mr. Goddard. Aye. Dr. Hildreth. Aye. Mr. Holloway. Aye. Mr. Hughes. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Ms. Ross. Aye. Mr. Sweeney. Aye. And Mr. Witzel. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Witzel. All right, um, I will go into my chair remarks. I first wanted to discuss my letter uh, to, T to Chief Drake on January 12th regarding the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th. I spoke very briefly um, about this with the executive committee at our meeting last, last week, but I really wanted to give the full board a longer and more in-depth explanation um, as to why I felt it was necessary to send that letter. In, in the days following the violence committed at the Capitol, there were several law enforcement agencies from across the country who began suspending officers pending investigation into their involvement in, in the insurrection. And actually, as of this weekend, 
The Associated Press is reporting that at least 31 officers in 12 states are under scrutiny. The Washington Post also published a story about law enforcement agencies reckoning with white supremacism and right-wing extremism within their organizations in the wake of the insurrection. Houston Police Chief Art Acevedo, the president of the major city's chiefs association, acknowledged the need to ensure officers with such inclinations never become part of the police force in the first place. I decided to be proactive and ask Chief Drake to confirm MNPD had not launched any similar investigations at that time and to make sure that the Nashville community was not kept in the dark. I also asked to know what the consequences would be if an officer was found to have participated and what actions MNPD takes or will take to proactively prevent the radicalization of its officers or the hiring of officers whose backgrounds indicate extremist support. Chief Drake uh, responded promptly, confirming no investigations existed and MNPD would take a matter such as that very seriously. But I didn't get a response on the second part of my letter. The letter was also a bit personal to me. Over the past four years, our minority communities have had to endure the trauma of an administration pursuing and enacting policies with harmful consequences for us, not to mention regu regularly using dehumanizing language when speaking of immigrants. It was the reason why in 2019, I requested an MNCO policy advisory report examining local law enforcement policies and immigration actions. I wanted to make it clear to our immigrant community that MNPD had no involvement with ICE. I hear very often from individuals who are victims of crime who are too scared to go to the police, fearing separation from their families, which is an all too real possibility for them. I wanted to give them some peace. When she learned about the officer involvement in the insurrection, Linda Williams, the president of the National Black Law Enforcement Executives, said she was sad and disappointed but not surprised. She said black officers across the country are absolutely looking around their departments wondering what they might know or not know about the people they work with. I was not surprised either. And I immediately thought of the Fraternal Order of Police's social media posts for the last six months. On September 4th, the Nashville FOP shared the National FOP social media graphic endorsing the former president. The Post proudly endorsed him on behalf of the 355,000 members of the Fraternal Order of Police. On October 24th, the Nashville FOP retweeted a picture from the White House press secretary of the president's limo under an American flag with a thin blue line. We saw the thin blue line in many images from January 6th, but the one that sticks out to me the most was the patch worn by the masked man walking the Senate gallery, armed with a taser and carrying flexicuffs. He was from Nashville. This is what people see when they see the thin blue line. On October 27th, the Nashville FOP shared a picture of police officers with the phrase, hold the line, written in capital letters across it. We saw people holding the line on January 6th, chanting it as they destroyed federal property and assaulted police officers. On January 8th, the Nashville FOP shared the National FOP statement dis disavowing the comments of the Chicago FOP president who defended the insurrectionists and stated his belief in the lie of a stolen election. I'm not singling out any officer. I'm not claiming any MNPD officer participated in or was sym sympathetic to the insurrection on January 6th. And I'm glad that MNPD has not had any reason to open an investigation. But what I'm saying is that an organization claiming to speak for many of them endorsed the catalyst of a deadly attack on our nation's capital. That endorsement has an impact in this community. It has an impact on the citizens of this community who may think law enforcement officers are working off their political stances instead of being a neutral party. It has an impact on minority officers as well. In Spanish, we have a saying, dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. Tell me who you're with and I'll tell you who you are. Based on the social media posts of the Nashville FOP, who is the Nashville community supposed to believe they are? I put myself in the position of our community members who think twice about calling police out of fear. Fear that the people meant to help them may actually cause more harm than good. In my letter, I clearly stated that my inquiry was not meant to infringe on any officer's First Amendment rights, and I firmly stand by that. Finally, I wanted to address um, 
a news story that aired last night on News Channel 4. The story questioned the Community Oversight Board's integrity, objectivity, and fairness. The Community Oversight Board conducts administrative investigations into allegations of police misconduct. The board may refer such matters to the MNPD and recommend that discipline be given within the parameters of civil service rules and regulations. The Community Oversight Board has no say in and does not contribute to criminal cases. In our legal system, the decision to prosecute a person for a criminal offense is for prosecutors to make. If any member of the community or the media has any questions about the Community, community Oversight Board's impartiality in any of the deci de de decisions that we've made, that we have made, they are more than welcome to bring it to my attention. Um, I want to go, oh, I want to open it up for discussion here, but before I do that, I um, ask that you refrain from discussing the specifics of any ongoing criminal case so we don't give any further false impression that we're trying to interfere in any way. Um, so if anybody has any questions or comments, um, happy to hear them. Is um, Officer Holloway, um, there's some information that was put on Facebook um, by one of the Metro officers, and I'm trying to get the information. And uh, if I can, I will get with you as soon as I received it and uh, see if the information was proper from a sworn officer of the Metropolitan Police Department. And this officer been suspended and demoted once before, and now he just got promoted just recently after Anderson has left, and it had something to do with um, him putting stuff out on Facebook and the media that was derogatory. So if I can get that information, I'll get it to you. Okay, we'd get that to Director Fitcher. Any other questions or comments here before I move on to Director Fitcher for the Executive Director's Report? Yes, um, Chair Martinez. Yes. This is uh, Ms. Davis. I'm sorry, I couldn't find my raised uh, hand function here, so I apologize. I'm going out of order. Is that okay? You're fine. Thank you. Um, so, uh, first and foremost, um, I'm not sure if I know that we take minutes and notes here of our meetings and i know that um this is being recorded and will be shared out but if at all possible um if i can make a, just a request if this needs to be made as a vote that's fine i can make a motion but i do believe that um the the chair um uh remarks that we just heard should be uh formalized and um put on the website and uh, shared um, on our social media platforms, and I'm sure other members of the board agree with me. Um, I think that members of the public that um, beyond even Nashville that have not had a chance to hear and see this need to, um, and because it speaks uh, to various levels of how many people, how others are feeling right now, um, including myself. And so, I, I think that that's very important, it's powerful, um, and, and many people are feeling voiceless and silent and need that. Um, so that that's my first um, comment here. And then um, my second is um, just, just quickly here, I would just ask, there is, there is a need here both on a national level, but if we cannot even, you know, in on what we can control this in front of us, in front of us on MMPD, uh, this to investigate and to look into whether or not there is an infiltration of white supremacy and um, white supremacist groups within our law enforcement. And, you know, and I would assume we have the support of our chief of police in this space. And so perhaps this is for another space for us to talk about, but I do wonder if the body of the COB is a space where, and what our powers would be to, to call on that type of review, not just to be reactive when something happens like that of January 6th, but to be proactive 
to do, determine what exists within the ranks. Um, we've seen, you know, the laborious process of what took place in the fall of a report of many paper uh, pages of a volume and volumes of policies of what the pe people of Nashville need to know is just what is the current state of their police department here and now, and uh, at the root of it, uh, who needs who needs to be sat down and taken out um, because they are simply not. Uh, embodying the true principles of MMPD. And so I would uh, I'd love to hear just what um, what others feel could uh, and should take place there. Thank you, uh, Ms. Davis. Now I'll hold discussion on that point and, and move on to Mr. Kamalguch here first. Um, I was in a similar space as Ms. Davis would just like inquiry around what official actions um, we can take and what our powers are as a board to make sure that we are looking into this thoroughly. Also um, wanted to mention that several, I know our information is public, but it was quite shocking to me that certain board members' information would just be streamed out there, um, like the reality of the situation on the ground isn't what it is. Like we haven't seen violence be done. Um, and I think that you mentioned, Chair. So I just wanted to mention that here and also um, talk through, I know these meetings are on the record um, and I know this is a public forum, but I'm also knowing if anyone else's experience it has been like mine, that there's a level of this that feels like very unsafe and unsettling. Um, and I've already made my peace with that being a part of just the work that I've been chosen to do. But I'm curious about what it would look like if we were to be able to have a space where we can talk to each other about how these things are affecting us personally. Um, yeah, and just curious about what other board members' experiences have been um, as we wade through these waters. Thank you, Mr. Kendall Gooch. Um, it is important that we do pay attention to our safety and you're right. And I mean, it's one of the main reasons too why I wrote that letter is because of the violence that we see. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. And if any board members have any input on that, happy to hear it. Um, Mr. Hughes, do you have your hand up? I do, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, thank you so much to the uh, board members who have spoken up already regarding this issue. Uh, first, um, thank you to the Chair for uh, pinning this, um, this letter and expressing the sentiments therein. Um, I happen to share a great deal in common with the sentiments that have been shared both by um, uh, the board members who have spoken and also uh, concerning the issue of uh, these these uh, very concerning uh, elements, potentially within law enforcement spaces that uh, in many ways risk public safety and uh, are a danger to uh, the public more generally, but certainly to communities, to the relationship with communities that are extremely vulnerable in this moment. And so I'm just uh, very grateful for the opportunity that we have to, to address these concerns and to give voice to them. Uh, in many conversations that I've had with members of the public uh, in the aftermath of the January 6th uh, insurrection and uprising, uh, they've expressed to me their desire and their concern to continue to have these dialogues around how it is that we build closer relationship. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very thankful that we are in a space uh, and have a vehicle like the Community Oversight Board to facilitate such conversations, which I consider to be very, very uh, necessary indeed. So thank you so much for raising this concern. Um, words of comfort to uh, to all who are being impacted in this moment and who are dealing with and recovering from a very traumatic um, uh, situation and incident, but certainly an ongoing concern for many members of the community. Thank you very much for letting me share. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Mr. Goddard. Uh, thank you. Um, let me first say I am 
moved and concerned by these comments I'm hearing, very sympathetic to them. Um, I, just just one thing, respond, Mr. Campbell Gooch. I would like to ask Mr. Pinkley if he knows right now, that's great, but if not, to take a look and see whether it's possible uh, for this board to gather uh, and discuss these things outside the confines of a public meeting. And my, my specific question is, can we talk about and listen to others' personal experiences and concerns about being a member of the board, understanding there could be no discussion about any board action, thing to be voted on the board, anything like that. I know that would be unusual, but these are unusual times. And I just wonder if there's some way to thread that needle. Thank you, that's what I had. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. Um, Mr. Pinkley, I don't know if you have an answer to that off the top of your head. Um, I don't have a firm answer to that, but I will do some digging and maybe consult with Metro Legal as well, just to be 100% safe. Thank you, Mr. Pinkley. Um, anything else? I'm not sure if Mr. Kamaguchi, if you still had your hand up or if um, you didn't put it down. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, a couple, just a few more words um, that I think some of this is concerning because this board was created um, in the way that it was created to hopefully um, promote community members, regular everyday people to be involved in public safety. And some of this feels like people don't want regular people to be involved. Right, because if people are like afraid to even be here um, and work on this board and work on this thing, then it will diminish um, the relatability um, of bo of the board and the reflection of the entire community that the board represents at this current point. So I also wanted to name that and, and frame that up for why this is such um, a issue. That's true and, and pretty pertinent right now because we are, our council is accepting, you know, the applications for new board members. So um, that's definitely something that many potential people who want to serve on this board are probably taking into consideration given everything that's going on. Is there anything else on that? If not, we can move on to um, Director Fitchard for the Executive Director's Report for right now. All right, Director Fitchard. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, share a few things. So good afternoon to all the, the board members and those who are listening in. Um, I just want to be transparent and let the board know that a police officer involved shooting has occurred. Um, it occurred around uh, 2 33 o'clock um, and our assistant director Chris Clausey and investigator Vernon Johnson um, have responded to the location so I just wanted to get that out there um, and I also wanted to um, talk a little bit just to touch base on what happened today regarding um, the calls that I received so I received multiple calls from citizens regarding the news story that um, Mr. Martinez mentioned earlier I felt like the calls became increasingly intense in nature and some of, you know, and as I tried to help reduce the conflict um, and listen to the caller's concerns, it didn't seem to really help. And so, um, and I was, you know, concerned um, by a few of the caller's remarks um, today. So I just wanted to let everyone know about that. And then secondly, I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that over the course of a year um, that I was the executive director, I've also received threatening um, letters in the mail. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there so that everyone knows that you're not the only ones, that this is also spilling over into the staff. So um, I am going to move on to the, to the executive director's report. And so it'll be brief. Um, 
we at the office of course our office is located in the washington square building and the the building our office did not sustain direct impact during the christmas day bombing however the the washington square building did suffer significant damage to the 214 side which faces bank street and also the windows in the front of the building were blown out so there's lots of um, wood covering the space um, where windows used to be um, the property manager has lifted the stay away directive and the building is structurally sound at this time i went over to the office this week and some of the other staff members as well um, but the mnco office will remain closed to the public and the staff will continue to telecommute and monitor the safety precautions that we have set in place um, but the complaint process has continued without interruption um, so that's good um, the m um, so as a personnel update, um, A.D. Clausey will start the process to move forward on filling our open investigator position. He's reached out and talked with HR and finance and budget to get that prepared. Um, and he also last week participated in interviewing um, two vacancies that were in the Metro Finance Department. Um, the MNCO team staff continue to do their trainings um, through webinars, and they just um, completed one um, that was called Policing Racial Justice and Abolition Movements, and that was hosted by the American Sociological Association's Crime Law and Deviant Section. Since our last board meeting, we have had four investigative complaints and assisted with seven non-complaint calls since the last meeting in December. Um, of course, with community outreach, we I think that we are doing really well in keeping up our social media platforms. Um, we have talked about starting next month having um, some community conversations um, so that we can educate the public on the work that we do and make certain that the public knows that we're here available to them and also get to know us on a more personal level. Um, I was also a guest panelist and an attendee for the Public Safety Committee community meetings regarding license plate readers. Those meetings were open to the public and included criminal justice stakeholders, human rights advocates, community members, and subject matter experts. Our MNCO research analysts are working on the research advisory report that was initiated by the NAACP. Um, that report focuses on the hiring procedures of the police department and have, they have interviewed Deputy Chief Loki, the HR director for MNPD, Sue Bibb, and Lieutenant Hampton, who manages recru recruitment and backgrounds. Um, and Dr. Valier has attended two LPR public safety meetings in January, and he's also a part of a special committee meeting on jail system data. And so, and then of course, the, the research team, along with our community liaison, um, Ms. Thompson, have worked really diligently and hard on the um, COB annual report that will be due to the state legislator on February 1. An update on the body worn cameras. Um, it seems like the West Precinct, East Precinct, countywide traffic, the special response team, the Office of Community Engagement and Partnerships, and a new team called the Titans, um, which I didn't really know what the Titans team was. And so I will share that information with you. That team has um, been outfitted. It's a, apparently a team of six. Um, three of the teams out of, of the six have been outfitted with, with body cams. That team is, let me get you that information. So the Titans team is a team that, it's a new unit that's created in the Specialized Investigation Division. It focuses on investigating violent crimes and gang crimes. They respond to the homicides. They work with homicide detectives on investigations. Um, they are also, they liaison with other departments and agencies, um, and they really focus on um, violent crime investigations. Um, there's a, a recruit class that has 57 recruits, and they will receive training and equipment, which means the body cameras. Um, there's also planning to begin deployment to Madison and the North Precincts to outfit them with the body-worn cameras and the in-car cameras once they get the equipment from the vendor. 
So to date, 320 active employees are equipped with the body worn cameras and 183 vehicles are equipped with the in-car cameras. There, there's been uh, 163 community service bureau lieutenants and sergeants trained and the wireless infrastructure build out for the in-car cameras upload is complete and all at, all at all of the precincts and there continues to be no unresolved issues with the equipment or the storage capabilities. The proposed resolution report response. So on Friday, January the 22nd, I received the PER response dated December the 22nd from MMPD. Um, the letter was written by the Office of Professional Accountability Director, Kathy Moranti on behalf of Chief Drake. Um, it stated that the board's recommendation was carefully reviewed and accepted. Um, although no policy change would happen. We are gonna talk a little bit about that this afternoon. Um, and the letter stated that the officer supervisor informed him in writing that he should have taken a report and that he should have responded to the hospital to take a statement from the complainant. And we can have a further discussion on that shortly. Um, I attended the after action review board meeting on Friday, January the 22nd. The first meeting basically was just to discuss the process and what some of the expectations were. Um, we were greeted by Chief Drake who shared his thoughts on the importance of the board's purpose. He reiterated his support of having the review board that included members of MMPD as well as, I mean, outside of MMPD. So um, he was grateful for the service that we were, that the COB was offering. Um, to be a part of this. And um, he said he was looking forward to the final report and welcomed any change in procedures um, that would help keep MMPD in line with best practices. Um, and so we will meet weekly until the process is completed. And our next meeting is this Friday at 3 p.m. I also received a call from Deputy Chief Michelle Richter. It was an introductory meeting. She wanted to tell me about the different divisions that she commands under the Special Investigations Division. Um, and so she just kind of enlightened me on the services that they offer to the community. Um, there's also, I've been scheduled a to attend a force review board meeting on Thursday, February the 4th. Um, and so that will happen at 10.30 a.m. We are working diligently on the Metro fiscal year 22 budget. We, um, I met with my executive team um, to discuss the different aspects of, of the budget as well as the performance management information. So we are, we are ready to make our submissions. Um, and so um, it, our budget at this point looks really well. And we have, um, I think that we have met our goals as it pertains to the budget, which is we haven't actually spent a lot of our budget, um, our operating budget, because we haven't been in the office. We've been working remotely. So um, basically that concludes the January 2021 ED report. If you have any questions, I'll take them now. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, I, uh, thank you for that report, uh, Director. Um, I know you said that this was pretty much new uh, information with the Titans team, but I am curious about what that is. I um, haven't heard of that um, team before, but they sound very close to the um, juvenile task force that was disbanded. So any information about that team that, that is getting um, cameras, I, I would love. Sure. I, I was going to, I checked with Captain Laura about it. That's the information that he gave me, but I also felt like they've changed so much within the department. They haven't kept me in the loop on the changes or, and, and, and haven't let me know of the, um, you know, who, you know, what specialized units that they have created. So I'm going to follow up with an email to, um, chief, to Captain Laura, as well as deputy chief, um, Mike Hager to get that information. So once I get it, I'll share it. Any more questions for Director Fitchard? If not, why don't we go ahead and discuss um, the response to the proposed resolution report. So initially when we received it, we were um, unclear 
as to whether or not it actually addressed the the policy issue that we recommended MNPD fix. Um, but with further clarification and getting this roll call uh, training that was implemented after our proposed resolution reports, it seems that um, our concern here is uh, fixed. And Director Fitchard can speak more about that. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so as I went over the policy that was um, that initially that we received from Director Moranti regarding the tra traffic crash documentation on her letter that she sent, it didn't really um, sh tell me what policy that she was taking this information from. She didn't have the policy cited. So I went back and read over the policy. And as I read over the policy, um, you know, there were some questions about it, um, in, in, especially as it pertained to what she highlighted in her letter, which was depending on the severity of crash, detailed collection of crash related information or close examination of information or evidence may not be possible at the scene of crash. I didn't necessarily think that that um, clarified the policy in a way that officers would know that they were required to take a report. And so, but when I asked her for the roll call training and she sent that, um, I think that her response in the roll call training, which is um, in letter C, I sent that to you all um, just a few minutes ago, by the way, sorry if you didn't get it ahead of time, but um, it says the follow-up activities, what she did was where it says information collection, it says depending on the nature of the crash, collection of evidence information may not be possible on scene. And then she put in parentheses, most commonly due to medical transport of a driver or witness, um, and then it says, in these instances, officers shall conduct follow-up investigations for information, such as obtaining statements from victims, witnesses and drivers, and collecting off-scene data. I think it actually meets the requirement that, what, that we said. It doesn't state it the way that um, the board stated it, but it does, I think, encompass what it is that we wanted it to do, which is if someone is taken to the hospital uh, and is not available to, to take a, to, for their statement to be taken, that an officer should follow up and make certain that their statement is taken. So um, also in this roll call training, um, it's they have a policy that says in accordance with the current requirements, the roll call training should be viewed in power DMS and properly signed for indicating the receipt and acknowledgement of a training. It's not actual training, but it is a directive. Um, they call it a training, but it seems like the officers are just actually required to sign off on this roll call and um, and uh, and once they sign off on it, then they are held accountable for it. So um, that's all I actually have now in regards to that. If there's any questions, I can take those, or I, I guess we will you will deliberate on whether or not you want to um, follow up with um, Chief Drake in regards to this um, particular recommendation. Thank you, Director Fitcher. Yeah, initially our concern was um, that if the response wasn't you know necessarily what we were looking for, then what recourse do we as a board have um given that they you know accepted that the officer should have um taken the statement of the woman but ultimately didn't and specified that there was a policy but when we first read the policy we didn't think that that covered it so initially we thought maybe the board would have to respond to um Ms. Moranti to ask for clarification there, but we asked for clarification and got some. So I don't know if anyone on the board it, it thinks that this merits more follow-up or if we are satisfied that this roll call training covers uh, that policy that we were looking to change.
I believe uh, I made a statement on that. Uh, I believe in December meeting, uh, in November meeting, that uh, I thought that the, um, I know for a fact the officer should have followed up on that uh, investigation to go to the hospital to see if he could grant a, a, a statement so she, he could get her, her side of the story on the, of the incident. And they say that a whole lot of problems, from different lawsuits and stuff. So that'll save him from being sued, you know, and it saves the cops from being sued. So giving everybody an opportunity to give their side of the incident and then he uh, doing this investigation on what he saw for and uh, his, his, uh, what he had observed from the, the crash of the incident. But I did make that statement prior uh, and I think in December or November. But uh, it saved a lot of problems to give everybody a chance to, to express their own opinion about the incident. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Any other thoughts from the board on this? And if there isn't, we can move on to and the next agenda item here. So after um, the last meeting, we had just mentioned the existence or we had actually council member Siles come and speak about her bill regarding uh, license plate readers. And since then, uh, Director Pritchard and I have attended information sessions um, put on by council member Gamble uh, regarding license plate readers, which have been informative and Director Pritchard was part of one of them. But um their council member styles's bill was withdrawn um at the first meeting at the first council meeting this year and two license plate reader bills still remain and dr Wither is going to go into more depth uh about them in a minute and but i just i wanted to say that i am not comfortable with the speed with which council is moving on these bills. And I don't think that there has been adequate community engagement. Um, while I did say the past two sessions have been really informative, but there was there hasn't been an opportunity for community input. Um, the pandemic that we're in has created a situation where we're not able to go out into the community and have to rely on technology instead. And we know how difficult it is to access technology um, even for us that have it. Um, furthermore, I, I, we haven't even implemented all the body-worn cameras yet. Um, why are we moving on to something new at the moment? I think this is something that should be deferred indefinitely until we are in a position where we can conduct authentic community engagement about this. Um, but I'll pass it over to Dr. Valier uh, to talk about the two remaining bills. Uh, thank you, Chair Martinez. I'm happy to update the board on these two bills. Both bills were deferred until next Tuesday's council meeting where they'll both be on second reading. Um, the two bills are one, uh, which is uh, 581 is sponsored by Rosenberg O'Connell Young and Sepulveda, and this bill would, the, the current law is that it's unlawful to operate a license plate reader installed on the right of way, and um, the bill would modify that in order to specify that it's unlawful to operate a license plate reader on, on a uh, right of way except for law enforcement vehicles, which are all already allowed as mobile license plate readers, but this um, change would make it more explicit. The other bill that is will also be on second reading is um, Bill 582, which is sponsored by Johnston, Poli, Nash, Rutherford, and Murphy. And this bill is, um, slight, is more comprehensive, um, a much 
larger um, bill that um, would allow LPRs uh, uh, if they comply with with re certain requirements, including having a usage and privacy policy that limits the use to investigating and prosecuting criminal offenses, detecting and uh, parking tra uh, civil traffic or parking violations, operating a smart parking or curb management program, or assisting in missing persons, including amber and silver alerts. Um, they, it also requires that there's an LPR custodian who manages the program, um, that there's restrictions on who is authorized users, and that the data is retained for no more than 30 days, unless it's evidence in a, for a criminal offense. Um, there, it also requires audits on a regular basis, um, restricts sharing to only being shared with law enforcement agencies, and requires some analysis based uh, of the stops for potential racial or ethnic disparities. Um, there's also an amendment to that bill sponsored by Councilman, Councilmember Rosenberg um, that will also be discussed that um, uh, would be a substitute bill which um, makes substantial changes to that. Uh, so I just wanted to give a very brief overview of what those bills are. There's um, quite a bit of complexity in each one. Um, is there anything else, Chair Martinez, that you'd like uh, for me to discuss? No, thank you, Dr. Billier. Unless our other board members here have questions. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yes, uh, thank you for that, Dr. Valeria. Uh, this question uh, may not be, there might not be an easy answer to this question, but I am curious about it. Do um, both of these bills, do they give any mention to uh, essentially whether L, uh, license plate readers will be housed? And the reason I'm asking that is because I know in other cities, their license plate readers are not housed in law enforcement. Um, so I'm just curious if there were any, if there was anything um, about that mentioned in that one, because also because in the last bill that we talked about that was sponsored by Styles, um, there was also a, a company called Velocity that was going to be uh, donating the equipment. So I'm also curious if that same company um, is mentioned in either one of these bills. Uh, neither bill specifies any um, contracts or purchasing. Um, neither would approve any installation of license plate readers, and that would have to be a separate uh, budget appropriation in order to, to purchase new license plate readers or to purchase software to adapt existing cameras into license plate readers. Um, it would all... Um, any, so departments would, as long as they're using it un, or under the Johnson, Pulley, Nash, Rutherford and Murphy bill, um, if LPRs are being used underneath um, one of the uh, allowable uses, um, it doesn't specify uh, what department has would be over it. Um, if, the, if the police department is uh, using it for those purposes it may be the police department however there are other i have heard of other cities um, having it departments or other departments um, being more in control of the databases uh, so there that's not fully addressed in either bill thank you dr villier any other question And I, I want to ask the board, um, given that the, I think, if I'm not mistaken, both of the bills are going to second or second reading uh, on Tuesday, right? Yes, that's correct. I want to ask the board if uh, we want to say something, urge council to uh, take a certain action um, given that it seems the progress of these bills isn't stopping and um, 
it may not be the best time to to have to pass these bills. What you uh, what you probably can do if if we uh, decide to make a stand on a, a certain situation on this, um, do one draft one letter and have it at, uh, put out all the name on all of the council and ask them to vote a certain way on it. You know, deferred or uh, until just deferred. Uh, you or you do not want to see this bill pass. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Holloway. Uh, Mr. Hughes? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think um, the, the challenge that we have and what I've, I've heard from several members of the community is that there's a little bit of uh, maybe confusion given the fact that there are multiple bills address addressing the concerns uh, specifically around LPRs. Uh, I think that what might be helpful is uh, for there to be a statement issued from the board that specifically talks about the elements of each of these bills so that the community is aware of what is in each of the bills. My understanding uh, is that specifically as it relates related to, uh, for example, um, uh, Councilperson uh, uh, Stiles' bill is that there was an element in that bill that allowed for there to be periodic reevaluation and reassessment of the program uh, and, and it is my understanding in my reading of the other two bills that, they, that these are not phased rollouts, that these would be, you know, full scale implementation or, uh, or nothing. Uh, and I think it is important to kind of express the differences in these bills and what elements there are so that there won't be any community confusion about the bills. I also agree, uh, however, um, with, the, uh, with the sentiment of uh, Member Holloway's uh, assertion that if, if we if we don't know uh, what it is that we don't know about these bills at present, um, it's, it's difficult for us to be able to give a vote of confidence to bills that are still kind of uh, in flux and, and being uh, kind of fleshed out. Uh, and so I, I would I would agree that it probably would be helpful both to to make a statement about what's in the bills, uh, but also to to say without uh, greater clarity and without there being uh, a consensus about whether or not this is something that can be done safely or in a way that can be periodically reviewed, uh, it would be, um, uh, I think, advantageous for the community to have us weigh in on whether or not this is something that we would favor passage for. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. <laughs> Mr. Kamaguch. I think board member uh, Davis had their hand up before me. Yeah. No, I, um, hey, hey there. Thanks um, um, so much. I'm, I'm happy to listen here. I was I'm actually trying to take in this information um, before I share because I guess I'm 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 uh, I'm kind of interested in how other members feel here because I'm concerned about the pace of what feels like. Um, something that is moving so swift that it, it appears it's trying to move faster than the community can, can keep up with it. And when um, when legislation moves like that, it always feels like it doesn't have the best of intentions. And so I would love to hear if I'm just wrong here. And if I am, I, I'm grateful for that. But that's what this feels like. And surveillance of this kind makes me incredibly uneasy. It also raises a lot of questions to me on just constitutional issues too, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, but the swiftness of this uh, causes me a lot of alarm, and that's why I'm, I, I'm, uh, I, I just kind of come back to our chair's initial question of should we raise, um, you know, uh, concern and ask um, uh, our council members to indeed. Um, speak up and, and pause and pump the brakes a bit here. So that, that's really what I was going to say. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Uh, Mr. Kamalguch. Yeah, I'm in a similar place. Um, the speed and the cadence seems to be outrageous. So maybe there's a narrative here where we tell them, like, they need to slow down and talk to people. Um, I was also thinking about, I, I know Styles 
Styles' bill had like a very specific um, aim, which was to deter drag racing. What I was curious about that entire time is that had, had they talked to any drag racers, right? So I'm just like, what would it look like um, to center this process and what the people want? Um, and also a thorough conversation around all options, because it seems um, weird to me that that the only way uh, that we can have safety is through surveillance. It's like we're it's like we would be giving up something like humongous. Uh, also, I know things like these uh, become slippery slopes. Uh, these were the type of um, um, hasty policies that kind of led to three seven two eight having like one of the highest incarceration rates in the country because of just like swift uh, policies that the community members that actually lived in the streets that they were trying to make safe weren't around for us. So I'm like, uh, I'm kind of in the same place as, as member Davis is just like, what would it look like if we just leaned on a narrative of, hey, you guys we just need to slow down a little bit and bring people in and talk to them. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Dr. Hildreth. Dr. Hildreth. Yes, thank you. Um, I speak in support of my colleague members who are very concerned about speed, timing, lack of community input, and lack of due process, which we know really at its heart of fundamental fairness includes notice of what's happening and an opportunity to be heard on what's happening before serious state action occurs. And I think it's important to name out loud that this environment of COVID safety means that we honestly do not have the rapid, full, and immediate input of our community as it used to be over a year ago when we would have been in this meeting in a, a large auditorium looking at members who decide whether they want to come in and hear firsthand and then speak to us afterwards and go forward. There seems to be a need to recognize that the world is a little different and in order to make it possible for our entire community to completely participate, it would be helpful if this could slow down. And I am wondering aloud, and I'm hoping that there will be an opportunity to hear maybe from Mr. John Button and the mayor's office about whether this is something that is also supported in the spirit of the recent policing um, task force and the other public civic conversations around policing that are happening. So I just, uh, I want to strongly affirm my colleagues' concern about timing and raise the possibility of having others come in and help us from a process perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Eldre. Ms. Ross. I also agree with our board members that we need to uh, ask for this to be slowed down. And I'm also concerned about with the city having financial problems, where's the funding coming from if it's an all out rollout? So that's my two concerns. Thank you, Ms. Ross. So I don't know if we need a vote here. Um, I'm happy to write a letter to council um, taking the sentiments that uh, the board here has expressed so that we can get it to them before the meeting next Tuesday. Um, Ms. Davis? Uh, yes, uh, Chairman Martinez. In, um, I think I, if you don't mind, I'm happy to to make the motion, but I think it stands. I think it, your your letter or correspondence on behalf of the board um, just has the the supported needs even more with that motion behind it, with that that uh, vote behind it. So I'm happy to just move that 
um, and y'all correct me here. I'm usually not on this side of it here, but help me out. But I think we should just move that um, that our, our chair uh, send a correspondence to the uh, city council requesting um, uh, that what and, and let me know if we want to time it differently, but at least what we we'll say 60 to 90 day um, uh, pause in this for a, a due diligence study. Um, and we can confer with our uh, staff here, especially uh, Dr. Valier, who's led this. Um, but I would say at least 90 days, because 60 days is, is such a blip in time for uh, community engagement and, and um, public forums um for the needed study and engagement that we've been talking about here today and we can fill in the bubbles here but i think that gets to the spirit of of my motion here thank you miss davis so there's a motion um i guess there's i need to, a second here before we go on to discuss the uh, the letter sure states for it to be de deferred um, uh, 60 or 90 days, whatever, but it, the, the terminology should be deferred. Deferred. Thank I'm you, happy sir. to amend it. Deferred uh, by 90 days. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Deferred by 90 days. Um, there's still a motion. I don't want to lose sight of that. So. Second. Thank you, Mr. I didn't know who it was. Um, Whistle. Thank you, Mr. Weitzel. Um, I, any focus discussion here, Mr. Sweeney, I see you had your hand up um, a while ago. Yes, um, I, I just suggest that a letter might not be enough to get attention and that in conjunction with the letter, there should be certain um, council members uh, who should be personally contacted. Um, in order to make sure that they get the attention of the letter and that they can work with other council members rather than it just being a piece of paper that's being delivered. Very good point. It, it should not should be certain council members. The letter should stay where all your council members should be on that letter. So all of them have, have access to it. Yeah, the letter to everybody, but communications special calls, personal visits, whatever, to particular members who would advance our position. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Um, any more focused discussion on the motion? I don't know if it needs to be amended there, but I can definitely work with uh, Director Fitcher to make sure we communicate directly with um, certain council members. If not, I guess I'll do a roll call vote here. Um, Mr. Campbell Gooch. A resounding aye. <laughs> Ms. Davis. Aye. Mr. Goddard. Aye. Dr. Hildreth. Aye. Mr. Holloway. Aye. Mr. Hughes? Mr. Hughes, are you there? And Dr. Lewis, I don't think, is with us. Ms. Ross? Aye. Mr. Sweeney? Aye. And Mr. Witzel? Aye. I vote I as well. So I will make sure that we get that done um, this week before the council meeting on Tuesday. Any other discussion on that before we change the topics? I see some hands up, just not sure. Um, yeah, I have a question. He said, yeah, a certain council member uh, sent the letter to. Who are the certain council members? Um, all of them got a job to do. All of them had to vote on it. The, um, that is my question. Yeah, the intent is to send the letter to all of the council members, but then um, given that we have certain relationships with particular council members to do 
more of an outreach to them, it's not just send them the letter. So it's to certain council members, we reach out and do um, more than just uh, do more than just send them a letter. Does that make sense, Mr. Holloway? No, it doesn't make sense. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to know who they are. That's true. I mean, we haven't decided on who that is, but I mean, we would have to sit down and decide that. Okay, get certain council members that you know are automatically a yes and they'll get it approved. Um, that might be in your favor. I might know some people on the council can do as well. Maybe not be the same people that you're talking about. Well, I, we'd be happy to consult with uh, all the board members. Um, if if you uh, would like to give us your suggestions on on who to you know speak with directly, let us know, and we can do that. Okay, we'll talk about it. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Um, Ms. Davis or Mr. Hughes, I don't know which. Yeah, Mr. Hughes. Thank you, Chair, for your patience. I was having some te technical difficulties during the vote. Uh, I know that the vote is already passed, but I did want to uh, give the sentiment that I am in agreement uh, with the with the letter as uh, as proposed in the uh, in the uh, in, in, in the the vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. There's nothing else on that. Um, we can move on to the annual report with uh, Dr. Belier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Or Chair Martinez. Um, the uh, MNCO staff, uh, particularly Ms. Orozco, Ms. Thompson and I, and assist in uh, consultation with Director Fitchard and Assistant Director Clausey, have been working for the past month to create the annual report um, for the Community Oversight Board. And um, that is due to the state legislature on February 1st. Um, you, uh, we sent the uh, draft of, of the report to you last over the weekend, and um, I hope that you've been able to um, ha have a chance to look at it and are able, if you have any feedback, um, to provide that um, either in the meeting today or uh, you can email me any feedback that you have on the report um, so that we can make any adjustments that you see fit. Uh, I think th the report is focused on highlighting the accomplishments of the board for the year, as well as the challenges that the city of Nashville has faced, um, as and the, how the community oversight board, as well as the staff, has worked throughout the year to continue the mission of the board um, to provide services to the Nashville community. So if there's any feedback uh, that board members have, I'm happy to hear it now. Um, or if you have anything via email, uh, please feel free to send that to me. Thank you, Dr. Valier. Does anyone have any feedback that they wanna give now? If not, um, Dr. Blue, do we want to set a, a deadline for feedback from board members? Uh, if all feedback could be sent uh, by Thursday night, that would be great. So we would have Friday to revise it since we will be sending it to the state legislature on Monday. Thank you, Dr. Villier. So uh, if you have any comments, feedback on the annual report, please send them to Dr. Villier by Thursday. And just a note about the report, once we get it sent to the state legislator, we will send it out for, for printing and for it to be bound. And I will make certain that each one of you get a copy of that. Thank you, Director Pritchard. Um, I'll move on to the next item here, uh, Mr. Pinkley, for the COB vacancy announcements. Uh, yes, thank you. 
Um, so we're in that time of year where the roll-offs are occurring and the upcoming elections for new board members are, are about ready to take place. Um, so I wanted to let everyone know that might be listening that the COB vacancy announcement, announcement has been posted on the COB website. Uh, so that is available for everyone's review that is interested in applying to work on the or to work with the board. Um, I will give a couple of important dates from that announcement. Uh, February 2nd is the deadline for nominations. Uh, and an important time to remember is 4.30 p.m. on February 2nd. If there are any nominations that come in after 4.30, they will not be considered. Uh, the next important date is February 9th which is the deadline for nominee information, which is essentially the nominee questionnaire that needs to be completed. And then the tentative dates for an appearance before the rules, confirmations and public elections committee and the actual election themselves, uh, that is scheduled for February 16th, 2021, but that may be rescheduled depending on the amount of turnout that we get for uh, applicants for the board. Uh, so just because the the first date is approaching quickly. Just wanted to remind everyone that the deadline for nominations is 4.30 p.m. on February 2nd. Thank you, Mr. Pinkley. Any questions on the vacancy announcements? If not, I think there is one public comment, if I'm not mistaken, Director Fitcher. Uh, that's all we have so far. Um, and Ms. Thompson is going to, let me make certain it's only one. Ms. Thompson is going to play that. Good evening, board. I'm going to go ahead and play the one public comment that we have received. announcements. Um, I wanted to bring something up that um, Mr. Pinkley had brought to our attention. The new legislation filed in the Tennessee legislature regarding our um, having to complete the police academy uh, in six months, if that's correct. If not, not being able to serve. Um, I wanted to get uh, board members thoughts on that, feedback on that, any um, advocate the ideas. Uh, I know it's early and the session hasn't even started, but um, we can already start thinking about ways we can um, try to defeat this. Mr. Chair, you may have a peanut. Sorry, Mr. Holloway? Do you may have a peanut in what you just stated? If anybody has any ideas on any, you know, advocacy actions, strategies on how we can um, defeat this legislation. 
Um, you know, I think it might be um, helpful if Mr. Pinkley um, highlighted the points so that the people who are listening in might, um, if they can't, if they don't have it or can't see it, that um, they understand what we're talking about. Sure. Uh, so uh, this bill that's been proposed uh, would require that all members of a community oversight board would be required to complete their local law enforcement citizen police academy within the first six months of service on a board. Uh, that would start with any member in January 1st, 2022. Um, it provides a year for those who are currently serving um, July 1st, 2021. Uh, but the change would be long-term that within six months of starting on the board, a, a member of the board would be required to complete the Citizens Police Academy within six months. Uh, if a member if a member fails to do so, uh, the oversight board as a whole would lose the authority granted to them until all members have completed the Citizens Police Academy. And I believe that's the the major change in that bill. Thank you, Mr. Pinkley. Uh, Mr. Sweeney. Um, yes, I mean, I don't, I don't think we've ever directly lobbied the legislature ourselves. And I don't know whether it's, um, you know, advisable that we do it or not, but obviously Metro has lobbyists. So I would think that we would want to coordinate, um, with, with Metro and their lobbying efforts and to get a consensus from the, um, members of the Davidson County delegation that this isn't necessary and that it's actually counterproductive because the police academy training here lasts longer than six months and therefore you couldn't complete it within six months and that it just makes a lot more sense for each community to conduct their police academy the way they conduct their police academy and under our provision, if I recall right, we're required to complete the training within a year, which is a reasonable period of time. So I would, I would suggest that we coordinate uh, with Metro and the lobbying team and we ask them to get the support of the delegation to, um, you know, um, ad address this bill by getting it with, withdrawn or, or um, you know, defeated, whatever, because it doesn't serve a proper or effective purpose. Um, Todd, does this have a sponsor in both houses or is it only in one house? I, I've only seen that it's sponsored in the house. I haven't seen a Senate sponsor yet. I, I just checked online. It, at the moment online does not have a house sponsor. Does not have a Senate sponsor? I'm sorry, correct, does not have a Senate sponsor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Uh, Ms. Ross. I'm in agreement, agreement with Mr. Sweeney. Who's, who's sponsoring this bill? Representative Cassida. Okay. Um, my concern is too uh, well won't begin to Janu uh, January 2022. But due to the pandemic, uh, some of our new people have not been able to go through the police academy. Uh, citizen Police Academy. So uh, there needs to be more clarification also. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, this, this brought up a couple of things for me. Uh, one, um, in the light of recent events, like I would be concerned for anyone's safety um, doing this police academy, um, doing the civilian academy, whatever it's called. Second, um, I'm also you, executive, I mean, chair, you also brought up what type of like advocacy work. I think that happens twofold. I think if we just maybe activate and alert the people who organize to get this board here, um, whether it be Community Oversight Now and AACP, those different groups. And secondly, I'm curious on how this piece of legislation would affect the other boards across the entire state. 
Um, and if there is an opportunity there to create uh, not only just like a local pressure, but a statewide uh, press towards making sure that this does not pass. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Director Fitcher, I think we've uh, already started reaching out to the other community oversight entities in Tennessee, is that right? Yes, so I reached out today. Um, I spoke with Miss um, Virginia Wilson from Memphis, um, and I asked Mr. Clausey to reach out to Miss LaKenya Middlebrook. She's the executive director over the Knoxville office, which is called Police Advisory and Review Committee. Um, she wasn't available to speak with us, but I did speak with Ms. Um, Wilson from Memphis. Um, she had not heard about the legislation, and it, of course, she was very concerned. She is going to um, share that with her legal department and, the, and their representative for the state of Tennessee. Um, she has um, asked that we set up a meeting um, for next week where the three of us could sit down and talk um, regarding how this would affect um, each other's um, agencies. Um, and then I also wanted to make a note real quick regarding our charter, because it, you know, it says that the completion of the Metropolitan Nashville Citizens of Police Academy is a suggestion as well as or an equi equivalent training. And so I think that this bill kind of knocks that equivalent training completely out, um, which is in our charter. Thank you, Director Pitcher. Uh, anything else on this? I know we have a lot of time given that the legislature doesn't end, uh, doesn't begin until later um, later this year, but um, we can definitely take it up in subsequent meetings um, and also already start in, in some of the strategies that we've named. I think whether this be a pass or not, we we need to in-house um, continue to do our business. Uh, if we got people that have not gone through the training, need to make preparation for them. And if we got new people that going to be coming in, have them prepared to go in at the same time. And if we got somebody that never did, didn't complete, they definitely need to go there. We had one person to do but three days of them. They definitely need to go. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Ms. Davis? Yes, thank you. Just really quickly, I understand um, I understand some of the members here, but I, I just, look, it, there are, this is, um, let's be very frank, this is, this is an attempt to, um, to thwart um, the authority and the purpose of this board and any board across the state that exists to represent the community. You can write it up however you want, but that's what this is. Um, so, um, this, we, we, we saw this in the, we saw this in the tea leaves before we knew it was coming. We have to be vigilant. We can't let this pass as a board without being vocal and going on record about how stringently we oppose this because we do not need the hand of uh, legislators coming in and trying to dictate something when there is more than enough on their plate that they, they need to be worried about as we sit in very embarrassing scores in the midst of a global pandemic. That should be their focus right now, not dictating six months of an agency's citizen police academy with people who are raising their hand to try to protect and serve others and represent on the COB. So we do need to speak up because this right here is deplorable actions by the likes of Cassida. Secondly, I also find it really embarrassing, um, one, that we have to expend energy here, but I understand why, and I appreciate our chair bringing this to our attention as well as the director Fitcher. But I want us to also remain, and I say this vigilant, and I think everyone knows why I'm saying this here, is I 
won't have the space to say this here, but I, I want us to also be very careful as they continue to sit, and we've seen these landmines they put in our place in, in front of us so that we have to spend a lot of time work focusing here as they're planting another one six miles down the road for us to have to deal with down away from here, because we know they're planting another one uh, just a few steps away. Um, and then also we just want to say, let's just say it does pass, right? If that's going to be the case, not everyone is positioned the same way to go to these in-person police academy meetings, even if they are masked, right? I may be with zero, uh, you know, uh, dispositions of health where I can just mask up twice and be fine, but everyone's not in that same position, and we should not ask them to come out into the same space. So if MMPD is willing to put all of these police academy um, classroom trainings virtual and make them where we can sit in through WebEx and, and tune in, then fine. Then everyone can absolutely meet that requirement. But if they cannot 100% say that they can keep everyone safe, then absolutely not. It should not be required and they should understand that. And if it needs to be that the governor, Governor Lee, exacts, uh, sends out an executive order saying that he understands and until the pandemic is over, it will be understood under that, then that is exactly what he should do as the leader of our state and govern as such, because it's that important to keep people safe and alive. And I think we need to say that in writing as the COB, and I have a good feeling that the rest of the governing boards of COB around the state will agree with us. That's how serious this is, because people are dying. And too many times we're just okay with saying, it's okay, put a mask on, or unfortunately, some of our neighbors are still not putting masks on. But I am embarrassed that any of our members in any of the state house would put out something like this in the time when a global pandemic is going on. This, to me, is just, uh, quite frankly, lack of leadership to me. It's, it's tone deaf. Thank you, Ms. Davis, for putting it in that way. And Ms. Ross. Okay, so what is our plan? I like what Ms. Davis said, so what is our plan? And who are we addressing to? Because one thing, all of the community oversight boards in the state do not have citizen police academies. Um, so they just go away without having training. And it seems like it's the major cities, Knoxville, Memphis, and Nashville, that this is being addressed to when I, I feel that education is important and that a lot of focus could be more on education and worrying about us going through training because we have been doing some training online through uh, Nicole. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ross. Mr. Goddard? Uh, yes, thank you. I, I don't know what our plan should be. Uh, I think the next step should be, as I believe it was Matt mentioned, uh, communicating with uh, Metro's government relations lobbying uh, people, whoever that is. Um, a lot of bills are, are filed that have no chance of getting passed and, and no real intent of the sponsor to push it very hard. This one has one sponsor in one house, doesn't have a sponsor in the other. If it's got, if it's not going anywhere, I don't know that we need to draw attention to it. I, I say that as a legitimate statement of ignorance. I do not know, but I would want to be informed by uh, the lobbying experts that Metro has on that before deciding specifically on a plan. Uh, that, that's my suggestion. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. And Mr. Witzel? Uh, my question is, Is uh, should we consider a collective effort with other organizations like ours across the state that this will also affect? Okay. And Mr. Kambaguch, I saw your hand up. Yeah, I think uh, Board Member Witzel was kind of getting to what I, I, I had suggested earlier just like connecting with grassroots orgs that are on the ground that maybe do some of this work. But I also want to say that I think that this is going to continuously happen every year. Uh, just like every time they're in session, they're going to have some wild bill that does something to the COB that's aimed, that's aimed at taking community power away from holding police accountable. So um, I'm also curious on like not only what the effort to get this out of the way, 
would look like, but also how we can incorporate this into our long-term plans of making sure that this board is as strong as it possibly can be. Thank you, Mr. Kalamuguch. Mr. Witzel, did you still have your hand up? I'm sorry, I forgot to lower it. Thanks, Mr. Witzel. Um, I am thinking that we should, you know, see if or consult the professionals, the lobbyists, uh, Metro's lobbyists that are available to us um, and see what their take is. And then we can keep discussing this um, in the coming weeks, uh, especially at the next executive committee meeting, um, where we can get an update on any meeting that we have with uh, Metro's public affairs um, consultants there. And by the next time that we have our executive committee meeting, I would have met with um, Ms. Middlebrook and Ms. Wilson to get the take on how um, what's happening in their cities um, and them reaching out to either their mayor and their committees um, to kind of see what in, to feel the temperature of what they want to do as well. Great. Then unless anyone's opposed, I think. Um, we should do that and just monitor the situation in the meantime um, while we you know, consult with the other community oversight boards and, and Metro's lobbyists. Is there any other new business? Oh, Ms. Davis? Just really quickly, um, I just wanted to say two things. One, I know that Director Fitchard is going to send this out, um, or maybe already has, but yesterday afternoon around 4, 15, 4.30, I received um, uh, from uh, former Mayor Carl Dean a report from Chief Drake to the Policing Policy Commission. Um, there's a narrative there, a couple of paragraphs long, um, that shares that um, this week um, apparently marks Chief Drake's second month on the, the job. It goes on to say that um, it details out that this has been very busy. It talks a bit about the Christmas Day bombing um, and that um, and, uh, Mayor Dean is speaking on behalf of himself and Mr. Lewis, um, who were the two co-chairs of the Pol uh, policing policy commission at the end of this um he says at the end of this correspondence he says um that he's uh sharing a report on behalf of chief drake um it's the initial report from chief drake to the policing policy commission and he's emphasizing the word initial um, because it describes how the department is acting on the recommendations that the commission believes required immediate action. Um, as some may remember, there were some that they were, we, we um, and I can say some of the policy, uh, I spoke on behalf, I can speak on behalf of policy, we titled immediate versus they could take 30, 60, 90 days. Um, and it just tells you a bit of the timeline of where they are. Um, he goes on to say a bit about how Chief Drake is clearly, clearly committed to transparency and account accountability. And a great example of that is the department's willingness to create a website that will track their progress on meeting our our recommendations, our being the policing policy commission. And sorry about my puppy in the background there. Um, and so um, just for the board's awareness, I forwarded this over to our chair, also to uh, Director Fitcher. Um, the report itself is, um, I believe it is about, it is, somewhat lengthy, but it should be here, right? It is about um, maybe 25, 20 something odd pages. I may be a, bit, a little bit off there, but everyone will have it, uh, a copy of it, I'm sure is something that should be posted online too and will be, um, but I have not gotten a chance to go through it thoroughly, so I won't speak to it in detail, um, but I do think that the public should be made aware of this, so we'll make sure that it is made aware um, and made available. So I wanted folks to know that. Um, and uh, Chair Martinez, I will send in an email a correspondence to Mayor Dean and Mr. Lewis with you CC'd here 
um, just noting them that that effective date of Jan January 31st, moving forward, they should be emailing you so that no correspondence is missed uh, just in the interim space of uh, filling that next seat. So that was the first piece. And then my last note here um, is just, I know we spoke earlier, and, and thanks to Mr. Pinkley here, about the COB vacancy announcements. If you all allow me just a little bit of space, I just have to say I want to acknowledge here in the space here, uh, since one of these seats here is one that I will be vacating, I want to just say for anyone who can hear, will hear this recording or hearing this live, if you are even thinking about uh, submitting your petition and you need a signature um, for um, uh, one of these seats or the seat, my seat here, then I'm getting up out of here. And this is not even mine, this is the public seat. I want you to do it. Don't count yourself out, count yourself in. Uh, the city needs you. If you're thinking about it, there's a reason. If it's itching and you can't, you're waking up at night and you're thinking about it, there's a reason for it. Um, this, is, this is why. January 6th is why. Our city is why. Um, you moved here for a reason, this is why. You're a native of Nashville, that's why. Uh, the diversity of this board is why. And so I just wanted to encourage uh, people to, to opt out, opt in and not out, um, because it, especially um, as, as folks look around on this board and start to think, uh, well, I don't have that background or this background, it's certainly important um, that, that you don't try to mirror or match yourself to the person that's leaving the seat, but that you look first within and see your passion to, to fulfill the, the mission and purpose of the COB. So with that, uh, that, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Very important points there. Um, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, just a quick report um, from the Rules Committee. Um, we met uh, earlier this week to go through um, the to to do the annual review of the rules and the bylaws and um we came up with a, a tentative um agreement as to most of the provisions and the committee will be meeting again to review those and there are one or two substantive issues that um, will probably brought, be brought to the board for more full uh consideration but this being my last meeting and being the chair of that committee, um, I do suggest that a new chair be appointed to take this matter forward and to conclude it. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Does, and I don't know if we have to decide this today, um, does any member of the rules committee uh, volunteer to be chair if, if there are members of the rules committee that are um, coming back yes there are um, and I think this is something that we can decide um, later uh, the next time we meet as a rules committee uh, but we're also going to have to fill Mr. Sweeney's spot on the executive committee um, the spot for secretary. So um, I'll again take people into consideration for that. Um, I know, I think Director Fitcher, you had spoken to Mr. Goddard, if I'm not mistake, mistaken, about possibly um, filling the position for secretary and I, I can appoint someone to fill that position, is that, a, is that correct? That's correct. Um, Mr. Goddard, would you like to become our new secretary? I am willing to so serve if you desire, yes. Thank you, that was easy. Um, that's one, one uh, position down. So we still got the rules committee president uh, chair sorry um but it's, again that's something that we can decide later um anything else uh, mr campbell gooch yeah yeah i just wanted to say uh to all the board members that are rolling off that it has been a pleasure um to serve um both the citizens of nashville and to serve in this so 
honorable uh, task with you all. Some of you I would have probably never met. So I'm just like excited for you all, um, excited for whatever life brings your way. And also, I just wanted to say, I know that these times are difficult and I know that things um, in Nashville definitely politically heat up really fast and become really intense. But I'm having a great time. Um, and that is because I'm able to serve with you all. So I just wanted to say, like, love y'all, and I appreciate y'all so much. I think we all um, echo that statement, Mr. Campbell Rich. Any other new business here? Ms. Davis, is your hand up? Uh, no, I just said amen. No. <laughs> I do have one thing I want to say before we adjourn, and I want to just thank the members who served and really helping me as I, you know, took on this position and didn't really know what direction to go in and just for the support and sometimes the correction and then sometimes just the encouragement has been um, really life changing for me and helping me to develop in this leadership role. I'm immensely grateful to your service. And, and so I just thank you. And that's all I have to say about that. I don't want to get too emotional. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, it's been uh, a pleasure, a really good time um, working with everyone. And we're going to miss you, Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. It feels harder to do this in cyber relationship, but I just want to echo the sentiments that have been offered. Um, I deeply appreciate the service of those members who are rolling off. I too have benefited and grown and it's been good to be able to combine our strengths and work together. So thank you for your service. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. If there's nothing else, um, I think we can adjourn, motion to adjourn, if anyone wants to move. So move. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. Second. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. I'll do a roll call vote here. Mr. Kamagooch. Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Mr. Goddard? Aye. Dr. Hildreth? Aye. Mr. Holloway? Aye. Mr. Hughes? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Not here. Ms. Ross? Aye. Mr. Sweeney? Aye. Mr. Witzel? Aye. Thank you all very much for a great meeting. And have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Bye. All. Good night. Have a good one. Thanks, y'all. Take care. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.